turned into one Open the eyes of the blind There's no one who like you There's none like you Into the darkness you If I think of my life as a class and what I've really learned, I've learned a few things. First, I'm, I'm aware that I'm a child of God. It's such a, an amazing understanding to think that the it which made fleas and mountains and rivers and stars, made me. What I pray for is humility, to know that there is something greater than I. Then I have to know that the brute, the bigot, and the batterer are all children of God, whether they know it or not. And I'm supposed to treat them accordingly. 
And, and it's hard, and I blow it all the time. <laughs> Mongrel class of people! I'd like everybody to think of a statement by Terence. The statement is, I am a human being. Nothing human can be alien to me. If you can internalize the least portion of that, you will never be able to say of, a, of an act, a criminal act, or I couldn't do that. No matter how heinous the crime, if a human being did it, you have to say, I have in me all the components that are in her or in him. I intend to use my energies constructively as opposed to destructively. If you can do that about the negative, just think what you can do about the positive. If a human being dreams a great dream, dares to love somebody, if a human being dares to be Martin King or Mahatma Gandhi or Mother Teresa or Malcolm X, if a human being dares to be bigger than the condition into which she or he was born, it means so can you. And so you can try to stretch, stretch, stretch yourself. So you can internalize a homo sum. Humani nihila me alienum puto. I am a human being. Nothing human can be alien to me. That's one thing I'm learning. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending bring from above echoes of Submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed. Watching and waiting, looking above, filled with His goodness, lost in His love. This is my story. This is my.
praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior. Lord God, I have no idea where I'm going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe, I believe that the desire to please you does in fact please you and I hope that I have that desire in all that I'm doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore, I will trust you always. Though I may seem to be lost and in the shadow of death, I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works vindication and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He will not always accuse, nor will he keep his anger forever. He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he removes our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion for his children, so the Lord has compassion for those who fear him. For he knows how we are made. He remembers that we were dust. As for mortals, their days are like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it, and it is gone, and its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him, and his righteousness to children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord, O you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, obedient to his spoken word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers that do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works, in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, O my soul. The word of the Lord. If tragedy and chaos persist, Keep me from apathy. Give me a heart that loves deeply enough to break again and again. Give me a passion for peace that only burns brighter as time goes by. Thank you that your love has never stopped blazing. Thank you that no matter how many times our human race falls, you have never fallen into apathy. When we are faithless, you remain faithful. 
One day, I know, you'll give us a perfect peace that lasts forever. One day, every sorrow will be erased and every tear wiped away. One day, pain will be locked in a heavenly museum and hatred will be the stuff of history books. But I dare to ask for peace sooner than that. I dare to believe along with King David in Psalm 27:13 that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I dare to plead with you in the name of Jesus, in the name of the one who suffered, so that I could plead with you. Give us peace. Let us lift up our prayers over the strife in this world and for peace and harmony amongst all peoples. Thank you, O Lord, for always hearing and answering all our prayers. To you be the utmost glory. Amen.
Realizing that their father was dead, Joseph's brothers said, What if Joseph still bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong that we did to him? So they approached Joseph, saying, Your father gave this instruction before he died. Say to Joseph, I beg you, forgive the crime of your brothers and the wrong they did in harming you. Now therefore, please forgive the crime of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. Then his brothers also wept, fell down before him and said, We are here as your slaves. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid. Am I in the place of God? Even though you intended to do harm to me, God intended it for good in order to preserve a numerous people, as he is doing today. So have no fear. I myself will provide for you and your little ones. In this way, he reassured them, speaking kindly to them. The Word of the Lord. Hello boys and girls, this is Aunt Fernita, and I have a wonderful story to tell you, called Joseph Forgives His Brothers. Today's memory verse is from Colossians chapter 3, verse 13. It says, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. The message for today's story is we can forgive others because God forgives us. Has anyone done something really, really mean to you? Did you forgive them? Was it easy to do, or was it difficult? Joseph's brothers had done something really, really mean to him. Joseph looked at the eleven men standing uncomfortably in front of him. The men were strangers to the other people in the palace, just strangers who had journeyed to Egypt to buy food during the famine. But Joseph knew exactly who the men were. 
They were his brothers. Joseph's mind flooded with memories. He remembered how his ten older brothers had treated him. He remembered the horrible day they had pushed him into a big hole in the ground and then pulled him out only to sell him to be a slave in Egypt. It was time to tell his brothers that the man they were standing in front of, the man who looked like an Egyptian prince and ruled all of Egypt, second only to the king, was really their very own brother Joseph. Go, Joseph said to his servants. Soon only his brothers were left in the room. Tears began to stream down Joseph's face. I am Joseph, he exclaimed. I am your brother. Is my father still alive, he cried. <gasps> the brothers' mouths dropped open. Could this very important ruler of Egypt really be their brother? Suddenly they were so afraid. What would Joseph do to them? They had been so mean to him. They had sold him to be a slave. Come closer to me, Joseph said. He knew his brothers were frightened. I am your brother, Joseph. You sold me to be a slave in Egypt, but don't worry. God is really the one who sent me here. He sent me here to save your lives during this famine. Go home quickly, he said. Tell my father that I am ruler over all Egypt, second only to the king. Bring him here, and your children, and your grandchildren. You will live near me, and I will take care of you during the years of hunger. Then Joseph and his brothers talked for a very, very long time. Joseph told his brothers over and over again that he forgave them for what they had done. And Joseph had a lot of questions about his family. Reuben sighed a big sigh. <sighs> he felt good. He felt forgiven. Reuben looked around at his other brothers. He listened as they interrupted each other to tell Joseph happy stories about their children. Reuben knew his brothers felt forgiven too. They would bring their father and their families to Egypt, and Joseph would finally see his father again. Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him. Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I have had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother and your sister from your heart. The word of the Lord. You mentioned that the secret to really finding true happiness is forgiveness. What do you mean by that? It really means letting go of the past. It really means letting go of our perception that we need to hold a grievance the rest of our lives. That, that if we really want to hold on to grievances, we'll never really be happy. It's really a willingness to, to see the person in the light of love rather than in the action that happened. So it's really changing the perception. And it really means letting go of the past that we thought we wanted. You know, we can't really change that past. So it means really l releasing the negative perception of it and coming back to the present. That 
was a transcendent moment for me, bigger even than an aha. He said, forgiveness is giving up the hope that the past could be any different. Kabilule, Waokulu, Tinao Kishmi, 
اللي كوم يهيف كابيلو شتايو تنادمي تبريث خدثا تهيف لكم وثربين دي ماشلي خطايين ودو تنالا تكراني Now let us partake in the feast of the Lord. Use whatever you have to celebrate the life and resurrection, the body and blood of Christ. As the disciples ate and drank with our Lord at the Last Supper, we remember Christ now. Romans 14, 1 through 12. Welcome those who are weak in faith, but not for the purpose of quarreling over opinions. Some believe in eating anything, while the weak eat only vegetables. Those who eat must not despise those who abstain, and those who abstain must not pass judgment on those who eat, for God has welcomed them. Who are you to pass judgment on servants of another? It is before their own Lord that they stand or fall. And they will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make them stand. Some judge one day to be better than another, while others judge all days to be alike. Let all be fully convinced in their own minds. Those who observe the day, observe it in honor of the Lord. Also, those who eat, eat in honor of the Lord, since they give thanks to God. While those who abstain, abstain in honor of the Lord and give thanks to God. We do not live to ourselves, and we do not die to ourselves. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord of both the dead and the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother or sister? Or you, why do you despise your brother or sister? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then, each of us will be accountable to God. The word of the Lord. Today we get to talk about forgiveness. Uh, if you're like me, that's not an easy subject. I find that I'm quite capable of holding on to anger, resentment, hurt for a very long time. And especially if I feel like the slight, uh, the mistreatment was somehow intentional, uh, then I'm not inclined at all to be forgiving. In fact, I would rather that person somehow suffer some consequence uh, for what they did. So forgiveness is, at least for me, not an easy subject. I don't think it really is for any of us. And yet, all of us understand that forgiveness is central to our Christian faith. Forgiveness is at the heart of understanding how we relate to God, that God forgives us, uh, that though we have missed the mark, uh, one definition for sin is missing the mark, though we have sinned, we have missed the mark, intentionally or unintentionally, God is merciful and forgiving. And so it's central to how God relates to us and our understanding of God's generosity and grace and mercy. And then it needs to be central to our relationships with one another. So it's important that we think about and talk about forgiveness. So this morning, we are starting with uh, the gospel reading, which is Matthew 18. In this chapter, Jesus has several things to say about living together in a community together in a fellowship, a kind of shared life. And the first thing that he talks about in this chapter that we looked at last week is, is a related issue. What do you do when someone sins against you? And he doesn't talk about forgiveness at that point, but he talks about trying to go and speak to that person, trying to work it out, trying to find some resolution. And if that person truly has indeed uh, done wrong, trying to restore them back to 
the way of faith, the way that is right, the, the shared life that we're all trying to live in Christ. But afterwards, uh, we have Peter asking this question, which naturally follows, I think, uh, the earlier discussion. Matthew 18, beginning in verse 21, Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me? In other words, the first thing that was raised. And I forgive him up to seven times. Probably Peter's thinking he's trying to be generous. Uh, he's trying to go beyond. It seems I've heard that rabbis said usually something more like three times if someone offended you, did wrong, you should forgive them. But they also said, well, if the person is going to persist in being this way, you don't have to forgive them. And so perhaps if, if that's indeed what Peter was thinking, the, the usual recommendation was, well, three times, he's thinking, well, seven. Um, and seven, of course, in Jewish thinking was a, a kind of a number of completeness. Um, it's the days of creation. It's in so many ways, a, a, com a complete number it represents something in its in its fullness. And so he's thinking, well, maybe seven would be a good number. But Jesus, of course, responds and says, no, how about 70 times seven? Um, of course, he's not talking about a literal number. Don't do your math. That's not what he means. But he's saying, what if we don't count? What, what if we just quit keeping account? And then he tells this parable about a king and his servant. And the point he wants to make uh, is obviously to say something about God. And he does want us to reflect on how God is treating us and therefore how we ought to treat others. In other words, we need to emulate God. And so Peter's thinking, well, maybe if I forgive seven times. And I think Jesus is saying, well, let's first think about how the Father is in his own forgiveness of us. Uh, and maybe model our forgiveness for one another after our Father. So he tells the parable, the king has this servant who's coming in. Uh, he's This king's calling in various servants who owe him debts. And this servant comes in owing a tremendous amount. And the king says, well, you need to pay it. And if you can't pay it, well, then we'll sell all your possessions and sell you into servitude and you can work off your debt. And of course, the man begins to uh, bow down to the ground and plead and say, please give me more time. Now notice, in the parable, the man does not ask, please forgive my debt. He simply asks for the terms to be, uh, to be extended. Uh, I know it's supposed to be paid now, but can you just give me some more time? I'll, I'll figure out a way to do it. But the king, instead of granting his request, instead says, tell you what, let's just forget about it. You don't owe it anymore. Uh, it's not what is requested. It's not even in the mind of the servant to ask for forgiveness, uh, to have the debt released and done away with. The servant is just thinking, I'm going to need more time to make things right. I think when Jesus tells the story this way, he is trying to impress upon Peter and therefore on all of us that what God is doing is unexpected that forgiveness itself is unexpected. Uh, when, when we're thinking about forgiving others, it, we are thinking about doing something that is truly unexpected. If someone apologizes, you better forgive them because now they've already apologized. Uh, that's expected. But Jesus is talking about the forgiveness of God being something that catches us by surprise. And it's a radical uh, understanding and presentation of forgiveness. So he says, God is forgiving us even when we're not asking for it and completely removing the sense of indebtedness. Now, of course, the story goes on to, to talk about how that servant then in failing to appreciate what has happened. And some might suggest, well, did he not hear it? Did he... Was it because he was asking for a time extension that when the king says, I've forgiven the debt, all he heard was, you have more time? Did he go out and grab his fellow servant and try and get money from him because he thought he still had the burden of trying to repay? That's perhaps a possibility. Uh, 
Um, Jesus in the story doesn't say why he goes out and starts to strangle his his fellow servant, but that's a possibility. And maybe sometimes we're we're that way. We don't really hear the forgiveness of God, and so our failure to be forgiving towards others is because we've not really heard well that God has truly forgiven us. Uh, so maybe that's it, or maybe it's just because he he is so unappreciative of that grand uh, gesture of forgiveness that he wants to go out and gather some some money that others owe him and and doesn't want to do likewise, doesn't want to go be generous because the king was generous with him. But either way, it's, it's, it's a reprehensible act, which is why the other servants report him to the king. They say, this fellow you forgave, this enormous sum uh, is now out there strangling people trying to get money from them. And of course, the king's angry. And the king calls him in and says, well, how about you just go try and pay off that debt in prison like we originally talked about, if you're going to be so unappreciative. Well, sometimes we get worried about the end of this story because the parable ends with this idea of uh, maybe God will revoke it. But I really don't think that's what it's saying. I think the point of the parable is how unconscionable it would be for us to be unforgiving after having been forgiven. It is as ridiculous as this servant not being willing to forgive a meager amount when he had been forgiven a great amount. And so when the story ends and Jesus says uh, to the disciples that we must, um, in verse 35, my heavenly father will also do the same to you if each of you does not forgive his brother from your heart. We might get all worried at that point and say, well, what does from the heart mean? And we start hearing that as, as if it means we have to forgive perfectly, that somehow, unless I forgive perfectly, I won't be forgiven. And if we hear that, well, then we are in trouble because none of us are going to forgive perfectly. But I really think it's, it's Jesus saying the same sort of thing that he says in, in the Sermon on the Mount when he says, the measure we use, it will be measured back to us. I don't need to really worry that God will place some limitations on his forgiveness. What I really need to worry about is whether I will place some limitations on both the forgiveness I give and the forgiveness I receive. I'm the only one who can limit it. I'm the only one who can make it uh, go away because I'm not willing to extend it. So at the end, I think the point is not that I need to be able to forgive perfectly, not that that's what giving from the forgiving from the heart means, but I need to have a willingness and make the effort. It's the difference between trying to be forgiving and strangling my fellow man to get something. Jesus is saying, after we've been forgiven, let's try and go do likewise. And that's something that we're trying to do from the heart. We, we must live in the very way that we expect to be uh, treated by God. If I want to receive mercy, well, let me be merciful. If I want to experience the love of God, well, let me share the love of God. Uh, in all these ways, if I don't extend it in, in any of these respects, then I am not likely to know anything about what it is that God is providing. It's only in giving the same that I then receive it. It's only in extending the same, then do I enjoy it. And that's the point. But I wanted us to also look this morning at the Romans passage, because our reading from Romans 14 is not one that I'd ever thought about in terms of forgiveness. And yet it gave me an opportunity to read it in a new light as I looked at these various passages that have to do with forgiveness. Of course, we read the story of Joseph uh, forgiving his brothers, or, or really not forgiving them, telling them that he really had forgiven them. Uh, they were worried once Jacob died, oh no, he's been, he's been secretly harboring a grudge this whole time, and when dad passes away, that's when he's going to take his vengeance. And Joseph is saying, no, I'm not going to do that. So we have all these passages about forgiveness, and then I read the, the words of Paul from Romans 14 and, and thought, well, maybe I ought to read this as forgiveness as well. 
And you know, when I did, I found some interesting aspects. And so that's what I want us to look at then as well, is what Paul is saying in Romans 14, looking at it from the standpoint of forgiveness. Now, in, in Romans 14, Paul's at the end of his letter, and he's talking to a church that is made up of both Jews and Gentiles who have different traditions and practices from their past. And it seems like part of the problem in this church, in, in fact, in all the churches uh, out in the Roman and Greek world in those days, there were some Jewish Christians and there were others who were Gentile Christians. And because they had such different traditions and customs, those often uh, came into conflict. And that seems to be what's happening here in Rome. And Paul's addressing it and telling them how to work through it. So in Romans 14, beginning in verse 1, he says, Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinion. Well, the word, I'm reading the New American Standard, the word translated accept here, some translations will translate receive. And when I looked to see its definition in Greek, it its first meaning was to take as one's companion, which, which is not a short uh, one for one, word for word translation, but it tells us the, the very, you know, essential meaning of this word. Uh, probably no one translates it that way because it's too wordy, but that's what it means. When it says uh, receive this one or accept this one, it means to take this one, another person, as your companion, as a fellow companion with you, living life together, taking a journey together, uh, companions in, in a project of some sort. You work together as fellow workers. So what Paul is asking these Christians to do, those who think they know better and view others as being weak in their faith, and who of us uh, consider ourselves to be weak? None of us do. Uh, when we differ with others, uh, we consider ourselves to be right and, of course, the others to be wrong. I don't know anyone who says, no, I'm the one who's, who's weaker here and I really don't, don't understand as well. So he appeals to us to say, you've, here's a person who thinks differently than you. And of course, you think you're right. And you think their understanding, their faith um, is, is weak, it's flawed, it's imperfect. Well, receive that person, take that person as your companion. Be a companion together with that person. But he, he makes it explicit at the second part of the verse, but not so that you can pass judgment on their opinions. Don't take them as a companion simply because you can then turn around and start criticizing them and critiquing them and ultimately condemning them. I think the, the idea of passing judgment, I like to contrast with making judgments. Passing judgments is kind of rendering an ultimate verdict about someone else based on what they believe or what they do making judgments, we, we do that all the time. Uh, it's, it's just to discern something, to see whether it might be beneficial or not. We need to be able to make judgments, but we don't need to be passing judgment. And so the idea here, I believe, of passing judgment is condemning. So it, he says, receive this person as your companion, but then don't just do that so you start turning around and condemning them. Uh, passing judgment on their opinions. Now, again, literally in the Greek, it, it says reasonings. In other words, the way in which they think and have reasoned about something. Now, often the way we reason about something might be incorrect. Uh, I know I've reasoned about things and therefore believed things and understood things in the past in certain ways that, that now I look at and think, how did I think that way? Um, and I realized I was wrong in how I had reasoned in my opinion, in my conviction that I held. And so if I have been wrong in the past, I'm sure I am wrong in the present and could be wrong again in the future about the way I think and about my reasonings. Well, Paul says, 
don't don't condemn one another for your convictions, for the way you think about things and have reasoned about things. And I think he's even saying, even if I know that person to be wrong, this is where I think forgiveness enters into the conversation. It's not that Paul uses the word forgiveness, but this idea of receiving the person whose understandings, whose reasonings, whose faith is imperfect, and it appears that way to you, and in fact, you might be right, to receive this person as a fellow companion, to take them in as a fellow traveler on the journey, is, I think, in a way, wrapped up in forgiving them for their wrong ideas, not holding it against them. Uh, we're forgiving one another for our ignorance. Now, that has good basis. Remember Jesus from the cross, a phrase that has become increasingly meaningful to me. Jesus says, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. And so I need to be like Christ. And here's this person who is aspiring to follow the same path of Christ as I am. And yet it appears to me, and in fact, I may be right, that they are uh, very immature in their belief and in their practices perhaps in their lifestyle, in their actions. Will I be willing to forgive them for being ignorant? To forgive them for being immature? To not hold it against them, the fact that they are not yet mature? Um, maybe I think, well, they should be mature by now. They shouldn't be immature. Well, there were times when I was more immature than I am now, or at least I hope so that I've grown in some maturity. So I believe there's a, there's a place here for forgiveness, for not holding it against them. In verse three, Paul outlines the two different ways in which we can think of others. And I think this applies in all kinds of circumstances, not only what he's talking about, he happens to be talking about uh, different opinions that Roman Christians held over dietary matters, some being Jews and wanted to hold to the Jewish traditions of what you could eat and couldn't eat. In other words, they wanted to eat kosher. And Gentiles who thought, well, that's a bit ridiculous. That's not a part of the gospel. And it doesn't matter whether it's those issues or other issues. Paul outlines the two, two positions that are possible. In verse 3, he says, the one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who does, for God has accepted him. So there's two possibilities, contempt or condemnation, judgment. If I believe that I understand better than this other person, I might not condemn them. I just have hold them in contempt. I'm condescending in my view, thinking, oh, they just don't understand. Poor, poor little person who doesn't understand. But that's so condescending. That's not love. Uh, and that's not mercy. And that's not graciousness. And that's not forgiving them for not being mature. But the other possibility is I feel like what they are thinking or what they are doing is not simply immature, but it's out and out wrong. And so my tendency would be to judge, to condemn. But Paul's answer to all of that is, well, but God has accepted him. God has received this one. Don't you realize, do you hear it again? It's all about the imitation of God. Um, if Jesus' parable is about, I need to be forgiving as God is forgiving, as seen in the parable of the the king who forgives the servant. Here it is, God is accepting and I need to be accepting. In fact, in chapter 15, he's going to say that we need to accept one another as Christ has accepted us. It's all about the imitation of God. And who am I to refuse to accept this person and forgive their imperfections when God is obviously accepting them and forgiving their imperfections? He's forgiving our ignorances uh, whether it's mine or yours or someone else's. So if that's what God's doing, then that's what we need to be doing. And he founds it, 
Paul founds, uh, bases it all on this in verse 4. Who are you to judge the servant of another? I mean, this other believer might be someone you need to uh, take as your companion, but you're not taking them as your servant. They're not your underling, subject to you and your judgments. They're, we're companions for one another. This other person, even if they're weak in faith, is your fellow traveler on this spiritual journey, a companion and not your servant. So who are you to judge the servant of another? Each of us is a servant of God, and it is to God that we answer. He's going to make that clear at the end. He's going to say, well, we're all going to stand before God and give an account. So I don't really have to take that role and make others give an account to me. Who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master, he stands or falls. And then I love this part. Because here's a confidence about how God is actually going to do things. And he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. In some ways, it sounds to me like Paul is saying we can forgive one another for our ignorance, for our imperfection, for our immaturity, because ultimately we're trusting that God will bring us all to maturity. That God will ultimately uh, teach us all. And even if I view someone else as being gravely wrong or very immature at this point, my trust in God is God will take care of that. And, and I, I can just accept them and receive them right now. If we bring together these passages we've looked at today and think a little bit about forgiveness, um, like I said, it's difficult. We, none of us find this easy to do. But when we look to God, we find how to be forgiving. We find the way in which God forgives us and the way that we need to be merciful towards one another. I saw a quote this week that said, mercy goes beyond forgiveness to love. And I thought that was a wonderful quote. I don't know who, who, who maybe said that, but mercy goes beyond forgiveness to love. And so as we've been talking about in the last few weeks about the centrality of love, forgiveness is something that is inherent to love. To forgive one another is to love one another. And to have mercy upon one another is to forgive and to grow in love. A community is only possible if we don't view one another with contempt and condemnation. Contempt and condemnation will tear a community apart, and there won't actually be any unity. But people who are forgiving and loving can find ways, even in their imperfection, to live together. And this God wills and will bring glory to the name of Jesus. People are often unreasonable, illogical, and self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, People may accuse you of selfish, ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone could destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find sincerity and happiness, they may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have and may it never be enough. Give the world the best you've got anyway. You see, in the final analysis, it is between you and your God. It was never between you and them anyway. Amen.